All right, it is now 4.45 UTC, so we'll start the session. I'd like to welcome everyone to session 1B, our package is one. This session is brought to you by our studio and the sponsor of the day is Absalon. So today we have three talks on three different R packages, starting with RCPP deep state, followed by a talk on the package risk metric. And finally, we'll have a talk on the poor man R package. Hello everyone, I'm Akila Chaudhary Kolla. Today I'll be presenting about RCPP deep state. This is a joint work with David Julian Hawking and Alex Gross. And this project is sponsored by our consortium. RCPP Deep State is a simple way to fast test RCP packages. Before moving on to RCPP Deep State, I would like to discuss about a simple problem. Let's look at this RCPP function that declares, initializes, and returns a value. And, and, and there are a few function calls where we are trying to access a value from a valid array index. Whereas in the next two function calls, we're trying to access invalid array indexes, and the function returns an undefined value. These, these type of function calls, it's the developer's responsibility to identify and handle these kind of subtle bugs in the code. The purpose of RCPP deep state is to make developers work easy by finding these kind of subtle bugs in the code. Before discussing about RCPP deep state, I would like to discuss about the building blocks of RCPP deep state, which are the fuzzing and the deep state. Fuzzing is a process of generating invalid, unexpected, and random data as inputs to a computer program, program, and you expect it to crash, fail, or generate errors with these kinds of inputs. Deep state, it is a means to run the unit test with a lot of puzzles. Unit tests in deep state are called as test harnesses. We would refer to this a lot in this presentation. Normally, deep state's test harnesses are returned in C++, and they provide interface to various symbolic execution tools, puzzle engines like AFL Horn for slip puzzle in the Eclipse. Puzzles, they provide a standard input with of type specific values, and they generate a stream of random data. Whereas deep state, it provides an advantage over puzzles by providing a C or C++ type input functions, such as deep state in deep state double, which generate int and double values respectively. These are useful for producing process specific data types in RCPP, RCPP. And moving on to the purpose of RCPP deep state, we have developed RCPP deep state tool. It's an easy to use fuzzing system for our packages using the RCPP framework. It's used for memory debugging and memory leak detection. When C++ combined with R libraries, it includes the speed and efficiency of the test harnesses. It also generalizes and automates the test harness generation. It provides an easy interfacing with puzzles like AFL and lib puzzle for input generation. RCPP deep state does the hard work of automating the matching of multiple functional parameters with type specific data generators like integer, double, vectors, both integer and numeric. Moving on to the related work section, our inspiration for developing RCPP deep state was from VRoom standalone package, which follows a do it by hand approach to run the C++ code under AFL fuzzer. There is no external framework that is implemented to provide an interface with an RCPP package and fuzzers in the VRoom standalone package. And there are other packages like R unit test and tiny test and unitizer which use predefined assertions on provided inputs, whereas the crown checks to provide automatic code analysis and then the test under sanitizers. Fuzzar and Autotest are other R packages which provide fuzzer specific inputs that are predefined or are mutated respectively. So uh, to get a clear understanding about RCPP deep state, we picked a package from our analysis that's BNSL and its function called MI. This is a simple definition of the function MI, where it takes X and Y as numeric vectors and an integer proc value. And the proc estimate is based on Jeffrey's prior MDL principle and views and empirical principles. The proc, the argument of the proc is missing, the proc zero is taken, and as a piece function call is made. And let's look at the predefined example of the BNSL package. 
and the size of the numeric vectors is 100, and the proc value keeps varying between 0 and 10. These examples are present in the nice example folder, and we run them under valid to see if they are producing any subtle bugs or if there are any unidentified issues in the code. So when we run the code under valid then I see an empty data table returning no error messages and no address messages showing that there is an error in the code for the examples. So, so can we say that this code is bug free as we didn't see any issues when we run the predefined examples under valid then? No, we cannot. Is testing the code on predefined inputs enough? No, it's not. Predefined inputs are unable to find the subtle bugs in the code as we, which we might encounter running the code on various unexpected or randomized inputs. So is there a way to automatically run the code on various unexpected or randomized inputs? Yes, there is. RCDP deep state is a solution to the problem. And moving on to how RCDP deep state works, Let's look at the building block of RCTP deep state. This is a basic test harness for the MI function, which we saw earlier, where we will be, for, uh, we will be generating randomized input data using these functions, RCTP deep state numeric vector and RCTP deep state integer. Input values for these numeric vectors X and Y are obtained from these functions. These are RCTP deep state's positive functions and they, they, those inputs were accepted and those inputs were taken to make a call to this MI function. And we run this test harness to see for any issues. And we also include an inbuilt RCVP exception handler so that there will be no code failures. So before moving on to discussing about how this test harness is being compiled or run, there are two main functions that we need to talk about for fuzzing a, for fuzzing a function under RCPP deep state. That is deep state fuzz fun is the first function. The deep state fuzz fun takes RCPP exports and it looks at the RCPP exports and it passes it for the prototypes and the list of the parameters of the function that we provided. It also allows the test harness generation and it also compiles and runs the test harness. Once we run the com once we compile and run the test harness, we get crash, face, fail, pass, extension files, depending upon the type of the response obtained by running the inputs on the executable. We do have another parameter called time limit seconds, where it will allow the user to specify the passing time on the executable. And I'll be using a three second default timer for now. And the next function is deep state fast fun analyze. It allows the user to analyze the binary files of the provided RCPP function under the presence of Polygram. It also looks for errors or bugs if there are any. It allows users to specify an initial seed value. This, is, this will serve as a start point of the fuzzing. Time limit seconds, this is another parameter which allows users to specify the time limit to analyze executable. This function returns a data table with the inputs that are passed to the function and the error message that was generated when those inputs were run on the function, and the position where the error occurred, like the file and the line number where the error occurred. Let's look at a real ex execution of the functions. Here, the input to the function is a package path and the function name and the time limit seconds. And we provided the package BNSL and its function MI. And we would like to see if there are any subtle bugs in the MI function. As we didn't see any bugs in the examples, we're trying to test it under RCPP deep state. So we are analyzing the compile run for the function. This, this step of the code generates, this step of the code generates the test harness and it also compiles and runs the test harness. And it will also generate the dot crash, dot fail, dot pass files that were the inputs that were run on the executable. So during the analysis phase, we take the path to the function, path to the MI function, and we run the deep state fast point analyze on that. And we see the executable is running and it's looking for any issues with the inputs that were run in the previous steps. And we see 
that there is an issue occurred and there is a data table return. If we look at the data table, there is an error of invalid read and a message of invalid read of size 8. It occurred in the file micmi.cpp at line 55. There is also an address trace message where it says zero bytes after a block of size 184 So let's get a deeper understanding of this message. Before that, let's look at the inputs that were passed to the function that caused the error. And the proc value that was passed is very large. And the X and Y vectors look something like this. The Y vector includes not available values, and there is an infinite value passed as well. So the function is adding some missing values to the numeric vector. So the line, so the error occurred at line 55 of the code. And as the proc value is very large, and my function makes a call to Jeffrey's am I? And the line 55 is the highlighted part of the code. It shouldn't occur when we are trying to create a table X, that is CX, and there's no issue occur when we are trying to create table CY, but there is an issue occur when we are trying to generate CXY table from both X and Y vectors. If the size of the vectors X and Y are not equal, the system generates an issue that causes an invalid read so we need to specify a condition to check the size of the vectors x and y are equal or not. Moving on to the results of RCPP deep state, this analysis was made on packages that were downloaded as of 2020-2020. And we first tested around 1,185 RCPP packages and it reported issues for more than 1,000 functions over nearly 412 packages. These were not detected using standard crank checks. These standard crank checks are run on manually specified tests or example inputs, whereas RCPP deep state on its tests on defined uh, unexpected or randomized inputs. The crank checks include all the Clang and GCC versions of undefined sanitizer and address sanitizer, and other tests like drone tests and M1 map tests and R check are also included. We see that RCBP deep state performs better when compared to CRAN additional checks. And this is a web page for RCBP test results. If there is an issue with your package, you can check it over here. And once you click on the package, you'll be able to see a, a HTML page like this, where it will be listing out the inputs that were passed and the message or showing the message that was generated when running those inputs on the executable of this function. And it also shows the file and the line number where the issue occurred. We also provide a Valibrin log. The Valibrin log is the one that we got when we run the executable in our local machine with those inputs. This is an executable test file. This is to reproduce the same error in your local machine. You can run this test file to get these errors. You can replicate the errors. Moving on to the experiment results section, RCBP deep state default fossil identified issues in 478 packages showing a better performance compared to well known mutation based fossils like AFL and LOC fossil. RCBP deep state identified issues in over 156 experimented functions, which is around 74 packages and 755 unexported functions, which is over around 406 packages. Moving on to the conclusion, our future work, we would like to improve fast testing with more realistic randomized inputs. And we would also like to extend the random generation functions for SCEP and list data types. We would also like to include RCPP deep state as a part of plan checks. And we would like to thank our consortium for funding RCPP deep state. And I would like to thank Robert Dylan Hawking and Alex Cross for mentoring this project. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your talk, Akila. I think to, for the interest of staying on time, we'll go straight to the next slide and to the next talk, which is by Douglas or Doug Kelkoff, data scientist at Roche. Hi, I'm Doug Kelkoff, and today I'm going to be presenting on some of the work that we've been doing in the R validation hub um, with regard to assessing package risk 
uh, in regulated industries. And this is work that I'm presenting on behalf of the R Validation Hub, which itself is supported by a bunch of contributors. And I've mentioned a few of the contributors that have been quite active in developing the risk metric package here, uh, Yilong, Marley, Eli, Eric, Mark, and Julianne. Um, so just give a quick overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I do want to give a, a quick intro to some of the unique challenges that we have within regulated industries and the use of R, um, a brief overview of risk metrics uh, design goals uh, to support this. And um, because this is more of a, a technical audience, I do want to give a, a dive into some of the internals, which isn't something I get to talk about too much. Um, usually we're talking to um, more like industry folks um, who are more interested in the application. And um, I want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit more about the implementation. Um, so just to give a little bit of background about regulated industries and some of the challenges they face. Um, so within uh, industries that are regulated, such as the pharmaceutical world, um, we have long histories of using licensed proprietary tools, um, especially for statistical analysis. Um, and more recently, R has become uh, quite a forerunner in terms of new methods development and as a preferred glue language for data science. And to address this, um, we're kind of looking for new ways that we can leverage that um, enthusiasm and all of the awesome software that's being produced in that world. Um, but at the same time, we have kind of this um, legacy expectation of how software is delivered and the types of expectations we can have and how those are documented. And so that leaves us with a little bit of a gap in terms of um, how we provably show that uh, software can be um, reliable and uh, robust and that it can re be reproducibly installed. Um, and we need ways to document that so that if um, we're ever faced with um, someone wanting to audit the work that we've done, we can show this proof of the decision-making process by which we chose to use that software. Um, so enter the R Validation Hub. Um, and this is an organization um, that's uh, really spanning quite a few different industries at this point, but is predominantly focused in the pharmaceutical industry uh, trying to build tools and processes and recommendations around how to use R specifically um, in, an, in, a regulated set, in a regulated setting. Um, this has had representation um, across about 60 different companies on our mailing list, um, so folks that are interested. And I'd say about 10 or so, they're actively contributing to the discussion and the um, recommendations that we're putting out. And a lot of those go through community feedback. So this, this is involving a lot of those um, 60 groups. And we do have representation also from finance and agriculture who have taken in interest, as well as um, security focused folks um, and quite a few others that have had um, an interest in the tooling um, for one use or another. And this is really aiming to patch some of those gaps um, so that we do have this kind of documented um, robust audit trail through which we can provably show that we um, have high confidence in the software that we're using. And for this, we um, have a primary package risk metric that we're using to do these um, assessments. And for further details, I do want to plug that we do have a website, pharmar.org, and you're welcome to check that out if you want to learn more, um, especially about the application and the industry in general, um, because this talk's going to be a little bit more focused on the implementation details. So um, just to describe the package a little bit before we jump into implementation, um, this package, Risk Metric, aims to provide some of that tooling to assess packages and make informed reproducible decisions um, so that we can support regulated decision making. And so some of the use cases that we're hoping to support uh, might be that a statistician wants to use a package and wants to know that it's broadly uh, used enough to justify using it for an exploratory analysis. Um, and maybe they're just doing this on a like a uh, person-to-person -person basis, just trying to make sure that they're using um, appropriate tools for their day-to-day -day task. Um, similarly, maybe an analyst wants to know um, that they can reproducibly share their work with a reviewer, and so that's kind of factoring in this idea of development stability. Um, but we also want to support kind of uh, the industry or, or the um, infrastructure around supporting R. And so perhaps you're an R systems administrator and you want to know that if you install a new package, uh, what impact will that have on the environment that you manage and um, how might users be affected? How will you have to manage um, the stability of a platform um, if you're going to accommodate this, the installation of an R package? 
And maybe um, if you're in quality assurance um, or um, to some kind of regulatory uh, interface to a, a health authority in the pharmaceutical case or some kind of regulator, um, maybe you want to know that you've done some due diligence to ensure that a package isn't malicious. Um, and so we hit on a few of these and uh, more importantly, provide um, this foundation for building these types of assessments. So some of the unique challenges that we face to do that is that this, this covers a pretty wide range of unique needs with varying levels of sensitivity, and they touch on different parts of a package life cycle. So perhaps um, if you're a statistician who's just looking to do some day-to-day -day work, you just wanna know that before you go out and install a package, it's going to be the right choice if there's maybe multiple packages that implement a method or that it's widely used and currently maintained. Um, but if you're on the more infrastructure side, maybe you want to um, know the effects that it's gonna have in a broader environment. And if you're more involved in the quality assurance or regulatory aspects, you really are more concerned with the um, security implications, the stability and the reproducibility to, to really show that audit trail. So there's quite a few different use cases. And from that, we have a few design objectives. So first and foremost, um, we do wanna accommodate a bunch of different sources of package metadata. And that can include pulling information from the web um, or things that you might compute locally. Um, as well, when you're collecting that metadata, we want to avoid recalculating the same things over and over again. So as a trivial case, you can imagine that um, if we wanted to find how many issues a package has there open from a source code representation, we might look at the description file um, to get a URL of the source code repository that which we can query an API to get the number of open issues. Um, and you know, a lot of things are gonna make use of that description file and the metadata in there. So we don't wanna to have to be recalculating that over and over again. Um, to minimize this amount of recalculation, especially for uh, computationally intensive tasks like running our command check or rate limited steps like um, querying APIs. So we do wanna kind of manage this dependency structure. And then also we wanna encourage contribution. So we don't want this to be, at least on the surface, um, overly complex. We want this to be fairly easy to extend. Um, and before we jump into the details, let's just quickly run through what we see as kind of the, fl the core data flow here. Um, and really what's happening is that we're, we're taking these different sources and we're trying to funnel them into a central data structure, representation of what this information would look like. And from that, we wanna score it into um, a unified score that we could use for somehow evaluating these packages against each other. And so we have a little bit of terminology that we use around that process. Um, we have package refs, references, um, that are a reference to where you're going out and getting this information. So that could be a local source code directory, it could be an installation into a library, or it could be a remote repository, um, either on CRAN, Bioconductor, GitHub, or GitLab, or something like that. And then we have what's called metrics, which are like singular criteria, uh, that are pulled out of the metadata that's extracted from these different sources. And that's where really where we're funneling into this kind of central data structure. And then we have scores, uh, which are numerics on the scale of zero to one. And that's kind of our, our way of aligning these different packages. Um, and then we uh, provide a little bit of added um, tooling just to summarize those scores, aggregate them. We really provide that as kind of like an extensible interface so that institutions can uh, derive their own scoring function that kind of suits their, their needs. All right, so um, now just to jump into the details, I'm gonna jump right into a package ref object um, because this is really the crux of our de design philosophy and it's a, a little unique. Um, so what we do is we implement this, this class, it's an S3 class called package ref. Um, and there's a bunch of, there's a subclass hierarchy to this. Um, so packages can be either install or source or remote. And even within remote packages, they could be from a number of different sources. And each one of those might have different behaviors in terms of how they go out and grab information. Um, but really we're trying to converge down on that um, unified way of representing some of this information. Um, for instance, uh, let's say if we were trying to assess the news of a package, um, whether that's up to date, um, the way that we would pull that news file might be different if, you, if we were pulling that information off of GitHub versus if we were pulling that information out of a source directory. Um, and to make this uh, rather accessible, we actually use an environment behind the scenes um, in, within this S3 structure 
Um, and that gives us a little bit of statefulness, meaning that we can go out and evaluate things and they show up in other parts of our code. So environments are kind of one of the few stateful class structures that we have within R. And um, we kind of leverage that to uh, present something that kind of looks like a list that you can index into, but is stateful. So we can allow one way of grabbing metadata to be reused over and over again without really having to go out and uh, reevaluate it multiple times. And it's lazily evaluated. So um, if I just create a package reference here, in this case on the risk metric package itself, um, we can see that I have an install um, and it's a subclass of a general package ref. And it comes with a bunch of different metadata fields. And you can see that it's already picked up some of the most important things for finding a package. It knows where it's at in my local system. Um, it uh, knows the version and the name. So not, not a whole lot yet. And you can see that there's a bunch of other fields that have these dot, dot, dots after them. And um, the way that our class structure is organized, that means that we can try to query this. And when we do query for that field, it will go out and fetch that information. So that's kind of one of the unique um, things about the way that we've set this up. So just to dig into that a little bit more, um, here I have that same object and we have a few dot, dot, dot items down here. And if I, just by the, in the process of indexing into it, trying to get this field help aliases, which was one of these uh, that's cut off on the screen, but one of these fields down below. Um, and I don't actually assign that out to anything. I just kind of leave it in this package object. And because it's this environment that's statefully managing these different fields, next time I look at it, I've got this new field derived. So that's not always desirable. Um, sometimes, uh, especially if you're trying to be um, absolutely kind of pure in the way that you're um, organizing your functions, you don't want this kind of state mucking things up. Um, but in our case, it becomes a really helpful feature. Um, so one of the things that this really helps us do is kind of expose the way that this can be extended really seamlessly and without very much um, background information about how this class operates. And that was a key um, design decision of ours because we wanted to make it easy for um, people in a developing industry that doesn't have a whole, a long history of using R to be able to contribute to this and to be able to um, get people involved that aren't maybe active and long-term R developers. Maybe they're from the um, infrastructure end of the, the um, life cycle or maybe from the quality end. We want to really kind of expose this as a interface for people to extend with new metrics. And what we can do, um, that, that indexing field, or uh, indexing into a field, just calling that um, kind of basic operator there, actually dispatches down into another function that can be easily extended. So um, in this case, uh, we're extending it for a field called example. Um, and the, the function itself is cache, to cache the value um, that's gonna go out and be fetched. Um, and this allows people to add new metrics and um, also kind of an interesting behavior that this allows for is that we can index into some of the fields that we've used. And if we hadn't already looked for this help aliases field, um, it would go out and calculate that for us, just like it did when we assigned it out to alias. Um, and this exposes a really um, elegant behavior that we quite like because it uh, means that we don't have to manage this interdependence between a bunch of uh, different metrics that are being evaluated, they can be executed in arbitrary order, and that dependency graph is just going to resolve itself as they need to be evaluated. So that makes it uh, much easier to go out and structure these things. Um, there's a little bit of familiarity with what fields are available, but beyond that, there's very little detailed knowledge that's needed of the class structure in order to implement a new metric. And um, if someone needs to, they can even dispatch on um, the, the subclass of the package reference itself um, to handle that differently. So in this case, uh, maybe the help aliases, once those are derived, those might be de need to be derived differently depending on whether the source is from CRAN or local. Um, but in our case, we could implement that uniquely if this data structure happened to look different. Um, from there, the process is fairly straightforward. So the rest of the, um, this data pipeline is really just kind of uh, data handling and aggregation. So we have an assess family of functions that actually tease out the, the um, atomic pieces of information from that metadata, and then a score family of functions that converts that uh, atomic representation into a numeric score on the range from zero to one. And we provide that function that I mentioned earlier, summarize scores, um, which if you happen to call it on a tibble, 
which is the case if you um, create multiple package refs, um, in this case by passing it a vector of package names, um, that summarized score will get evaluated automatically. And so we provide this kind of pipeable interface just to make it um, exceedingly simple to execute. Um, you can imagine if you were an um, administrator and you wanted to execute this across an entire library of packages, um, you could just maybe list all of the installed packages and go out and score all of them. Um, so in summary, we take kind of this unique approach to managing um, the interdependence of a bunch of different related metadata by using um, the S3 dispatch system as well as environments for stateful data passing um, to really lower the order dependence of our evaluation and the cognitive burden of trying to manage uh, a pretty interdependent execution uh, pipeline. Um, we leverage that dispatch system to uh, allow for interfacing with a bunch of different ways of um, assessing packages without really needing a whole lot of um, specific implementations, or at least we can focus those specific implementations where they're most needed. Um, and we double dispatch, you could say, on these um, S3 functions so that we're um, dispatching on the field name as well as the subclass, and that kind of gives us this quite extensible way of um, implementing very specific functionality. And overall, this has fostered some good engagement with our uh, related organizations and industry partners. Um, some of the contributors are even relatively new to R and are very interested in discussing the metrics, and this has provided a fairly accessible way of starting to implement those and even toy around with them in a local session to make that more communicative channel. So it's been a really productive design for um, the, the needs that we had. Um, so with that, I want to give thanks to all the people that have participated in the development, Elong, Marley, Eli, Eric, Mark, and Julianne, and I'm happy to field questions. Thank you. That was a great talk. So remember, you can type your questions in the Slack channel or in the Q&A panel here on Zoom. We have one minute or two minutes for questions. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next talk at 25 past the hour, which will be given by Nathan. Nathan Eastwood, a freelance data, data, data scientist and our programmer. I didn't see any questions pop up in the um, Zoom chat or in the Slack during the time, but I'm happy to answer if people um, have questions pop up throughout the day, um, I'll be monitoring the, the Slack channel throughout. So feel free to reach out if you have questions. Thank you for that. I was also keeping an eye on the Slack channel for that. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Eastwood. I'm a freelance R developer based in Amsterdam. And today I'm going to be introducing my data manipulation package, Poor Man. When working in R, it's very common that we need to do some data manipulation regardless of which field or discipline you might be working in. And the great thing about R is that we've actually got quite a few different options to do this. We've got base R itself, we've got dplyr, we've got data table. Like I say, today I'm going to be introducing my package, Poor Man. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a good understanding of why I think that there's a gap in this data manipulation market. So why it's needed, why it's useful. Let's start off by taking a look at an example. Here I've got some code written in base R and I'm working with the famous empty cars data set. I'm filtering some data, selecting some columns and creating some new columns. Here I've got the uh, kilometers per liter, the weight in kilograms. And then finally I'm selecting some columns in a particular order. And I get this resulting data set. So this is great. What's, what's the problem? Why, why, you know, why write poor man? Well, the problem with this code is that for, especially for new users, let's say that you're new to programming or maybe you're coming from Excel or SPSS, something like that. Looking at code such as this can be particularly jarring. There's a lot of subtleties going on here that you need to understand. And it can be quite tricky when you're first looking at this kind of code. And that, that makes the barrier to entry quite high. And to the, to the extent that actually uh, some training courses that I've seen these days actually skip over base and just start with tidyverse. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the dplyr alternative, or equivalent even. So here I have the exact same result. I start off with my data set empty cars, then I filter the rows, I select some columns, and then finally I create some new columns, putting them in a particular order. And this is great. This, this offers us this 
human readable API. And this, this is one of the key points that poor man tries to recreate. Um, it's ultimately what makes dplyr so popular. It really breaks down that barrier to entry, uh, especially when you have these really cool initiatives such as Tidy Tuesday as well, which offer examples of different data sets and give you the opportunity to work with these APIs and learn from other people, see how people you know, work with this API, how to produce these analysis sets. They can be a really great way for a new user to be onboarded with R. So human readable code reduces the barrier to entry. This is the first key point that I want to make today. So let's consider some scenarios now. Let's say, for example, you're doing some analysis and you are rerunning some code, it all works great. A few, few weeks go by, a few months maybe, maybe even a year. And all of a sudden you have to go back and rerun that code. Maybe you work in the financial industry and you get audited and you have to show how you got some particular financial results. So you go back to your script, you start running it and oh no, something doesn't work. How annoying is that? Well, this is probably because maybe you installed a newer version of a package and something in that package broke. It's not necessarily the code that you wrote. Another classic example is, let's say you write some code and you share it with a colleague or a coworker. But I know it doesn't work on their machine. How annoying is that? Why? You know, it works perfectly fine on your machine, but it doesn't work on theirs. It's classic programming issues. Well, this is probably because you've got different package versions. If, you, if you've got a, a dependency of a package, maybe, you know, you have a different version and that's what's breaking the code. Finally, let's, let's say that you're working towards a deadline and something isn't working in your code. Um, you might want to start debugging that code. Okay, so what, what's going on? Is it, is it my code? Is it the package that I'm working in? And if it is the package that you're working with, what happens if you don't understand how that package works? It can you know, really add to the time that it takes to be able to understand where the problem lies. Uh, and ultimately, if you're working towards a deadline, that's, that can be quite problematic. And this is where you get into something that I like to call dependency hell. Because ultimately, if you are adding these dependencies to your package, if you, uh, sorry, to, to your analysis, if you're adding a package, you really need to think, do I definitely need this package for my analysis to run? Can I use something else? Can I, can I work with base? Because ultimately, dependencies are an open invitation for other people to break your code. You know, if, 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 if a package maintainer or developer changes something in that package and it breaks your code, then it's not really their fault. They're well within their rights to do that. But ultimately, this is going to be quite annoying for you. You know, if something breaks, you have to take the time to figure out, OK, well, how is it broken? Where is it broken? And this can really be difficult to track down these bugs. So dependencies are an open invitation for other people to break your code. Please, when you're adding these packages to your analysis, to your project, really think, do you actually need it? But of course, Dependencies aren't all that bad. And, you know, we, we, we want this human readable API that we've been talking about. So, OK, we we you know, maybe we want to manage these dependencies in some way. And there are great solutions out there for that. There are tools such as Docker. Uh, maybe you want to go the R package route. So you might set up a Minicran server or maybe you want to work more locally at the project level. So you might consider using RM or Packrat. But the, the, these solutions, they have, a, they, they have problems themselves. Firstly, they are a dependency. You're adding another dependency to your solution. Um, they require prior knowledge that they even exist. Again, if you're a new user, maybe you're a new programmer, you might not have even seen these before. You might not have heard of them. So that means that they require time to learn. And then again, if we go back to that example where we're sharing code with a coworker or a colleague, all of a sudden, it's not just you that needs to spend the time and know about these, these, these solutions and learn how to use them. You now need buy-in from your team members, from your colleagues, your co-workers. They have to spend time learning it. So these solutions, you know, they come with their own problems. Now, when we're talking about complex code bases, dplyr is one of them. If you've ever looked under the hood of dplyr, there is a lot of code there. There's a lot going on. It's a package that's written very, very well. Um, you know, it's, it's a great package. 
but ultimately there is a lot of complex dispatches and abstraction that's going on to take away a lot of that uh, code and return things in a package-wide consistent manner. And this goes beyond dplyr itself. This, this goes into packages such as rlang and vectors, which are dependencies of dplyr. But again, you know, it offers this package-wide consistency, so it's understandable why this happens. But there are other abstractions as well. For example, we have C and C++ code in, in dplyr. And if you, you know, there's a whole other language that you then need to learn to understand how these things work and how they fit together. So it can be really difficult to learn from the dplyr code base. As a side note, to my knowledge, there are no discussions of you know, how these designs came about um, that are publicly available. There's no meeting minutes, for example. Um, and it can be particularly difficult to understand or reason with a decision that was made by the maintainers, especially if it's broken your code. You know, if, if something's broken, you think, well, this worked before, why have you changed it? And of course, ultimately, generic APIs are very, very difficult to design, right? Nobody gets these things right first time. Nobody's going to. Um, so the maintainers of dplyr and all of the tidyverse are well within their right to make these changes. So it's, it's not a bad thing on them. But ultimately, if you want to learn how they did it, you know, these, these complex code bases are difficult to learn from. And this is where poor man comes in. So poor man is a dependency free recreation of dplyr. And it does this in a completely unapologetic way. It really does just copy the dplyr API line, well, not line for line, but function for function. Um, and it does this all using base R. There's no C or C++. So you might be sitting there thinking, okay, well, what about speed? You know, how does it compare? Well, look, poor man, it's not trying to win any speed competitions. Poor man's focus is elsewhere. It's trying to create this human readable API in a dependency free manner in a way in which people can learn from. And what's great about that, because it's written in, in base, we actually get a benefit in that it installs in seconds, uh, whereas dplyr takes quite a while, for example. Now within the poor man package, there is almost a full suite of dplyr functionality. I think there's maybe some experimental features which aren't available, but otherwise you pretty much get the full whack. And also there's a couple of other things brought in from the wider tidyverse, you've got tidy select, you've got Magrita, you've got some tibble functionality. And to give you some confidence that this all works, there's over 700 tests written for poor man, a lot of which have actually been ported over from dplyr itself. So hopefully that gives you a bit of confidence that poor man is able to do the job that it claims to do. Because ultimately, if you take a dplyr script, you swap out the library call at the top, library dplyr, for library poor man, you should still be able to run that script end to end. It should still all work completely fine. And this ultimately makes poor man a great teaching tool. Uh, it's much easier to install than dplyr, so if you're teaching to a wide audience, then it's much easier to get them to install one de dependency versus dplyr and all of its dependencies. And you can still go ahead and use all the great you know, tools, examples, tutorials, Tidy Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera, that are developed for dplyr with poor man, because it works end to end. You take that script, you swap out that library call, and it will still work. And what I've tried to do when I've developed this package, because ultimately it is a teaching tool, I've really tried to explain the design decisions that I've made and how I wrote certain elements of the package in my blog posts. So if you're interested after this talk, you can go and, and, and take a look at those and learn a little bit about how to develop such a generic API in base. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. So this is the same example from the start of the talk. Um, all, I, all I've done here is I've changed that, that library call from library dplyr to library poor man. And now I'm taking my data, you know, my empty cars, I'm filtering the data, I'm selecting my columns, and then I'm mutating. Just wanna highlight a couple of things here as well, because ultimately we get the same result, right? This pipe is not the Magrita pipe. This pipe is actually what I call the poor pipe. It's included in poor man, it's written in base. And we've got features such as starts with, so tidy select features. Um, again, written in base, included in poor man, and I've got a great blog post which explains how I implemented all of these things as well. So compare this to dplyr. Again, you can see it's the exact same script. It's just all I've done is I've, I've just changed this library call and it still works. 
Poor Man also offers some group by and uh, summarize functionality. So here I've got the iris data set. I'm going to group by the species column, and then I'm going to summarize across the sepal columns, calculating the means, and I get this nice aggregated output. Poor Man also offers all of the join functionality. So here I've got a couple of data frames, data frame one, data frame two. Here I'm performing a, a mutating join. So I'm mutating data frame one by performing a left join, attaching the columns from data frame two. And then down here, I've got what's called a, a filter join. So I'm taking all of the rows from data frame one that don't have a match in data frame two. And then here's my resulting output. So take home messages. Human readable code reduces the barrier to entry for new users, new programmers. This human readable API that dplyr affords is re-implemented via poor man. And it's done in a dependency free way. And this is important because dependencies are an open invitation for people to break your code. We can manage these solutions, but ultimately if we can reduce them, that's even better. And complex code bases can be quite difficult to learn from. Dplyr has a lot of abstraction, it has a lot of dispatch that's going on. So poor man does this using base R and that's a great way to learn from, from poor man how to work with base. Now, I just want to leave you with this quote, which is, I'd seen my father, he was a poor man, and I watched him do astonishing things. Ultimately, this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. It's, it's when you do library poor man, you'll actually see this quote. Um, this is to say, well, yes, poor man is written in base, but base is fantastic. It's, it offers unrivaled, unparalleled levels of consistency. I can take a script that I wrote in base from 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, and it'll still run today perfectly fine which might not necessarily be the case if you're working with one of these packages which is under constant development. So, I'll leave it there. Thanks everyone for listening. I'd like to invite you to uh, ask any questions which you may have now, but I'll leave you with a couple of links. Here you can see the links to install the package. It is available on CRAN, so you can go and install it from there, or you can in install the development version from GitHub. There's also a Docker image that you can use as well if, if that's your jam. Um, I've also listed my blog here where you can go and learn about how I implement all these things. And finally, like I say, I am a freelance developer, so if you want to get in touch, here's my email address, my Twitter handle, and finally my LinkedIn profile. So again, thanks for listening. I'm now going to stop to take any questions. Thanks again, Nathan, and thanks to all three speakers. So we do have time for some questions, and I did see some questions streaming in on the Q&A. So I'm not sure if Nathan can actually read these questions. Uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, I guess I'll go through them one by one. Yeah, you just take um, them in the order they came in. Yeah, just take them in the order they came in. Cool. All right. So Christopher Maronga, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, asks, uh, I'm just wondering what is the difference between poor man and dplyr in terms of computation speed? So I haven't actually done much in the way of benchmarking. Um, I think this is a bit of a timeless question that's been asked quite a few times, you know, comparisons between base and dplyr. And actually, there's a couple of great, um, couple of great benchmarks that are already set up. Uh, that you can find online. I'll, I'll try and find them and post them in the Slack channel. Um, but yeah, I, I guess Dplyr, there's a few bits which are you know written to be more performant, and that's probably going to work a little bit faster than base, uh, in particular grouping operations. Uh, but my, my aim really wasn't to focus on speed with this. Um, I think if, if you really are concerned with speed, maybe uh, take a look at something like Data Table. But obviously, my aim here was to produce this human readable API for people using base and wanting to minimize their dependencies. Um, I, I, I do plan eventually to extend the package such that I offer uh, Data Table S3 methods, but that's way in the future yet. I, I depends when I get time. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question, how can poor man be at the same time fully backward compatible while com keeping in compatibility with dplyr when the latter is not fully compatible? Um, so what's the motivation behind poor man? Well, 
essentially my plan with uh, Poor Man is to keep it lean, but at the same time, I'm not planning on deprecating any functionality. So right now, I've kind of aimed for the DeepIR version one release. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware that functions such as, you know, mutate at or arrange all or select if, uh, those functions will be deprecated in a future version of uh, DeepIR. And so I don't plan to add those. Instead, the across functionality is there. So hopefully that will provide you all of the functionality that you need. And then moving forwards, I don't plan on deprecating anything. So if anything else gets deprecated from DeepIR, it will still remain in poor man, which should hopefully help with backwards compatibility. Um, okay, so there's a question of whether the poor pipe is lazy. It is not, it does just pass the data along. Um, I'm not sure if the new base R pipe is lazy, but that should work just the same. And you know, if you really want to, you can always use the agree to pipe if you wanted to. Um, would poor man be a good replacement one-to-one -one for deep in a production setting? Well, yes, I would like to argue so in the sense that, you know, I, I've taken the majority of the tests from DeepIR and I've written them uh, for poor man. So, you know, there's like over 700 tests now, I think, for poor man, which run on a CICD pipeline and yada, yada, yada. So I, I'd like to say that I'm pretty confident that it can be ran. Um, you might want to consider whether it is your best option, of course. Um, you know, if, if you're working in production, then maybe you want something that's maybe a little bit more sort of robust, you know, tested a little bit more in the wild, maybe something that's better for speed, such as data table, uh, or even deep life itself, of course. But if you're looking to reduce dependencies, then uh, maybe that's not, not the way to go. Um, okay, so it works only with data frames or also with tools with column lists. There is some support for column lists but I don't think I've got the full support yet. Um, I would need to double check. Uh, maybe I'll write a blog post about that. Sorry about that one. I can't, I can't answer that one off the top of my head. Uh, will having both poor man and deep liar cause issues require us to call poor man colon colon versus deep liar colon colon? Yes, because the mapping, so the, the, the exported poor man functionality is one-to-one -one with, with deep liar. That was a choice that I made very early on. There are actually a couple of other really great packages out there which have tried to do something similar to poor man, but the functions, they either have um, something prefixing or something appending the function name. So I think like one package has like select data, filter data, uh, whereas poor man just goes for select filter because I really wanted you to be able to take a deep eye script and just run it with poor man. Um, okay, will you have a new version of Poor Man? If yes, when someone uses it, the new versions may affect their work or codes. Yes, this is true, uh, but then, you know, it, that would mostly be bug fixes. Um, the API is not going to change. So the API that is available now should be available a year from now, two years from now. So the only things that would, you know, potentially break is actually if I was to fix things within the poor man package. So ultimately it's gonna give you uh, a more robust script. Um, does poor man have the pivot functions? That's actually something I'm working on right now. Uh, so watch this space. Uh, I'm working very hard on that right now. Um, so I, I plan on having pivot wider and pivot longer from, from tidyr included in poor man. Um, does poor man also provide functions from the, from the tidyverse? So yeah, it does. Uh, like I say, I, I'm planning on bringing uh, the pivot functionality, but there's also some of the functionality from tidyr. Uh, there's some from Tibble, I believe. Um, obviously you've got the agree to pipe the tidy select package. Uh, I'm planning to add some glue functionality in there at some point. Uh, sort of like a wrapper around it, but it, I, I, I haven't done that yet because I haven't decided on what I want to do. I don't really want to just go ahead and recreate glue. I may end up having like a poor man's version just using sprintf, but I haven't decided yet. Um, does poor man have any function that supports integration of Python code in R easily? I haven't tried it with Python. Um, maybe with like reticulate, you might be able to get around it, but I haven't, I haven't tried it. If, if anybody does, I'd be really interested to hear about it actually. Um, just to, you know, find out how well that works. 
Um, have I answered everything? Uh, there was a question here. Okay. Um, I think that's everything. I, I went through them as quickly as I could in the interest of time. Oh, uh, there's one yeah, more. Anything important like the janitor? Okay, uh, not yet. Again, that's something that I plan on um, plan on adding. And does it work with SQL queries? No, maybe sometime in the future, but it depends on how much time I get. Um, and that's everything. Thanks, if there's any more questions, of course, I'll be hanging around on Slack. So. Yeah, so up next, well, from 6.15 UTC, there's a 15-minute break. That's happening at the lobby channel on Slack. And after that, there's two sessions, one on data management and one on Shiny. So there we go. We can also stay here for a while because this session has three talks rather than four. So if there's any more questions for any of the speakers, feel free to ask them here or on the Slack, because we do have all speakers here. I see there's another question about Pullman. Um, so does Pullman improve Shiny app development? Uh, I mean, improve is a very vague term, I suppose. I mean, yeah, you can use it within Shiny. Um, there's no reason why not. So it, it depends on what you mean by improve, whether you mean in terms of performance, I'm not quite sure. So we do have one more question, and that's for Doug about risk metric. Doug, if you're there, can you hop in and answer? Uh, yeah, I didn't see this question come through yet, though. Oh, I see it up. from uh, Philip Ifmore. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, for risk metric, what metrics do you use to score the packages? Um, so this is a growing uh, cohort. Right now, they're fairly. Um, uh, simple, I would say. So we look at things like um, whether it has an identified maintainer, a lot of things that our command check also looks at, as well as our command check and like whether that throws errors or warnings, um, as well as some community um, uh, interaction. So um, we'll look at open issues, what percentage of the open issues have been closed in the last 30 days, um, things like that. And there's a full list on our GitHub page, um, or you can dig through the package and just look at um, what um, metric functions we have available. But uh, the purpose is really this foundation. Um, so the, it's meant to be easy to extend to incorporate new ones. So as we get more engagement, more people start looking to this to um, facilitate that kind of risk assessment process. Um, the intention is that those can then be easily contributed back and we can start growing this cohort. Um, yeah, so there's um, maybe 13 or so, um, ranging from things um, like package development best practices, um, all the way through to community engagement. And uh, maybe one of the things I think an opportunity to emphasize during the talk is that um, one of the things that's kind of nice about this, depending on where you're installing the package or, or looking at um, where the package or referring to where the package has been, um, is that the metrics get evaluated for that specific instance. So locally, I might be able to run our command checks successfully but someone on a different platform um, might encounter errors. And we that's an intended behavior um, that we're assessing risk really where the package has been, uh, where the package is referred to. So uh, even metrics themselves are um, kind of this like amorphous concept. So no independent testing. Oh, we do run our like all the uh, unit tests as well. So, um, and coverage itself is also a, um, uh, um, metric that we incorporate, um, but it is growing. So um, as those keep coming up, um, like maybe rolling in RCPP uh, deep state would be a cool way of, of looking at package fuzzing. Um, you know, the, as these things come up, we can start incorporating them as well. Um, is there a uh, consortium whitelist? So that's something that's been um, a hot topic recently. And we just started putting together um, a work stream to start looking into whether or not we would, uh, how, what that would look like. Um, and another thing that we're, we have kind of in the pipeline right now is to make it easy to um, incorporate like a, a badge onto a GitHub page or um, a, a repo page. And then it would be easy to get this numeric representation, um, which would be um, a little loose because it um, might be um, assumptive of the 
uh, image where that uh, risk score was derived, but is at least um, a representation of risk. So yeah, if you're interested in um, thinking about this whitelist um, and helping to develop that, there, that's definitely an area of opportunity right now at the R Validation Hub. Thanks for that. So there is one more question that came in for Nathan, but before that, I wanted to ask Akila one question, if she's still here. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't have time to ask this when I was mon monitoring the, the Slack during your talk, but I did see that you mentioned that one of the outputs in the um, in your package produces a data table. Was that, mm -hmm. why, was, uh, why was that chosen? Um, there's no specific reason because data. I I find that data tables are clear and easy to understand. A lot of the output versions that I'm working with are mostly data tables because of that. They're just easy to understand. They, they give a good column and row base. Am I not audible? Uh oh, uh, you a little low, at least for me. Okay. Do you have to repeat it? Yeah, please. Yeah, I use data. Yeah, I use data tables because they are easy to read and understand. There's no specific reason why I've chosen it. I just use. Uh, I do all the regex operations and in the when tracing when checking out for the Valgrind logs. So I found it to be easier. Okay, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. And if Nathan's still here, there's one more one question, more question from Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth. Ah, sorry. Yeah, okay, I see it. Not strange, the, uh, the Q&A pings up and down. Um, how can you call Pullman if you call Tidyverse? Um, so that will depend on which order you actually load in the packages. So if you did library tidyverse and then library poor man, the poor man functionality should be um, first on the call stack on, on the environment list. So uh, you won't need to prefix it with poor man colon colon. But if you did it the other way around, if you did library poor man and then library tidyverse, to get the poor man functionality, you would have to do poor man colon colon because otherwise um, that functionality is going to be masked by the functionality of dplyr. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, oh, I, I see a follow-up question to the Shiny question um, around about speeding up uh, deployment of Shiny. Um, yes, that's that's very true, uh, particularly when it comes to installation. Um, I mean, poor man installs in like seconds, whereas the Tidyverse, because there's all the compilation and all that jazz, um, it does take quite a while to install. So in, in, in that sense, yeah, it would probably uh, be faster to deploy Shiny apps, I guess. That's a good point. So if, while any other questions keep rolling in, I'll remind everyone once more that up next, we have a 15 minute break where you can all hang out in the lobby channel on Slack. And at 6.30 p.m. UTC, we have the next session. Session 2A is on data management, which has its own Slack channel. And session 2B is Shiny, which also has its own Slack channel. All right, so we will be wrapping this up because we need this room for the next session to start warming up. So once again, I'll thank all three speakers, our Zoom hosts, and the sponsors for today. Thanks again, everyone, and feel free to keep in touch using the Slack channel.